Hey guys, it's Henry Zed History, and welcome to this week's episode. Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and like Henry just told you, welcome to this week's episode, our next presidential series installment, and this week we're taking a look at who, Henry? Harry Truman. That's right, Harry Truman, and Henry, what number president is he? He's 33rd. That's right, he's the 33rd president of the United States, Harry S. Truman. We have some really, really fun, cool things to tell you about Harry Truman, and some really serious and pretty deep things to tell you about Harry Truman. But first, before we get into all of that stuff, Henry, tell the people what they have to do. Hit subscribe down below, leave all your comments, questions, give a thumbs up, and leave a like. Yeah, that's right. Good job, dude. Leave the uh, likes, leave the comments, the thumbs up, the questions. Of course, subscribe, hit the subscribe button. And then, of course, what else they got to hit? That little no, notification, notification bell. bell. So you can be notified when we do release new videos. And Henry, tell the people when that is. Every single week. It's every single week. Good job. So now, what we need you to do is sit back and relax. Because we're going to take a look at the man behind us. The 33rd President of the United States, Harry S. Truman. And this is... Dead History. Dead History. Hey guys, TJ back with you, here with Henry. Hi. And of course, the man behind us, the 33rd President of the United States, who is it, Henry? Harry S. Truman. Harry S. Truman, very good. Some really fun things to tell you about Harry Truman, such as he took over because he was the Vice President of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And when FDR died in office, mm -hmm. into his fourth term, by the way, Harry Truman then took over, of course, because he was Vice President. Yep. Yeah. But he was only vice president for like 82 days. What? Yeah, that's it. And FDR really did not tell Harry Truman much of anything. Not about the war, not about secret military operations happening, nothing. He really kind of left Harry Truman in the dark. So we'll get into all that, of course. Also, Harry Truman suffered his entire life from the time he was a child all the way through his adult life with really, really poor eyesight. So poor to the point where he actually failed his first military physical examination due to his poor eyesight. But he actually passed it the second time, and you know how he did that, Henry? Oh. He memorized the eye chart. Yeah, he actually memorized what all the letters were on the eye chart so he could pass the eye exam. So we're gonna get into all that, of course. And then, of course, like I told you briefly before, some really deep, serious stuff regarding Harry S. Truman, such as he had to make that really difficult decision and that ultimate decision to drop the atomic bomb. We're going to get into all that, too, of course. So they did what? They did the subscribes, right? Yep. They did the likes. Yes. They did the we comments. Comment. They did the questions. We need those comments and yes. questions, right? Yeah. Come on, Logan. Come on, Noah. Come on, Rebecca. Come on, Les. Who else? Come on, Edward. There's all of them, right? Yeah. Oh. All of our cool fans. Dominic and all you guys. Make sure you keep those comments and questions coming. We love those, right? We get yeah. very excited when we see the comments and questions. Mm -hmm. So they did all that. They did the comments and questions, hopefully. The likes, the subscribes, the notification bells. Henry, you know what they got to do. It's like, you know, like that old jingle when you used to go to the movies. <laughs> Let's all go to the movies. Or what is it? Let's all go to the lobby. And what do they have to get? What do they got to get? The popcorn and the pretzels. Oh, you have the popcorn, pretzels. And what else? The potato? The potato the chips. The potato chips, too. That's right. Go get those snacks. The chips, the pretzels, the popcorn, the soda. Yep. And now sit back and relax. Because it's... The next presidential series installment here at Dead History, taking a look at the man, where? Right yeah, behind guys. us here, yup. The 33rd president of the United States, Harry S. Truman. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and welcome to our next presidential series installment as we take a look at the 33rd president of the United States, Harry S. Truman. And I'm here today with good old Henry. Hello. Hello, hello. And first and foremost, we want to say now when everybody's watching this video, it'll be about four or five days after the fact. 
but we still wanted to wish all of the dads and the fathers out there a very happy, happy Father's, Father's Day. Day. That's right, a very happy Father's Day from Henry and I. Uh, you know, thank you to all you dads and you fathers out there for all you do. I hope you had a wonderful day. Uh, this morning, Henry and I visited uh, Henry's grandfather, my my father. Uh, it's the first Father's Day without my dad around. He uh, passed away in February. So we went and visited his grave site. And, um, right, Henry? Yep. Said hello to Grandpa. And then uh, Henry left an American flag at his grave site. So it was, you know, a very nice uh, little time we we had there at the uh, cemetery, military cemetery here in uh, New Jersey. So we just wanted to say happy Father's Day to everybody out there. So now moving on, um, you know, Harry Truman's an interesting president because, uh, you know, a lot of people, if you talk to a lot of historians, they will probably tell you, give him a grade of, you know, toward the upper echelon of uh, presidents, uh, you know, say he was a great president. Then there's plenty of historians who will tell you he was either an average or below average president. Uh, it's very mixed reviews, to be honest with you. I tend to put Harry Truman toward the top tier of presidents, probably in the B plus to A range, if I had to grade him. Uh, I think Truman was, uh, you know, was left with making a really, really, really hard decision in dropping the atomic bomb, which we will get into in part two tomorrow. Uh, but... Um, you know, probably the hardest decision or at least one of the hardest decisions any uh, president has ever had to uh, face here uh, in the United States. So uh, and then, of course, today we're going to take a look at the early life, the birthplace, the childhood, the education and early political career of Harry Truman. That's what we do in these part ones. Um, but first, you know what? Hey, Henry, I have a question for you. Ooh. Do you want to know the question? Yeah. You look a little stunned. <laughs> you want to know? Yeah. Okay. So my question to you is, Henry, is Harry S. Truman. What does the S in Harry S. Truman stand for? Nothing. Wow. Good job. Look at you. You're very good. You're absolutely right. It doesn't stand for anything. We're going to get into that here in a little bit. Good job, Henry. Thanks. All right. So now we're going to jump right in. Harry Truman was born in Lamar, Missouri on May 8th of 1884. He was the oldest child of John Anderson Truman and Martha Ellen Young Truman. He was named for his maternal uncle, Harrison Harry Young. His middle initial S honors his grandfathers, Anderson Ship Truman and Solomon Young. A brother, John Vivian, was born soon after Harry, followed by sister Mary Jane. Truman's ancestry is primarily English with some Scot-Irish, German, and French. John Truman was a farmer and livestock dealer. The family lived in Lamar, Missouri until Harry was 10 months old when they moved to a farm near Harrisonville, Missouri. The family next moved to Belton, and in 1887, to his grandparents' 600-acre farm in Grandview. When Truman was six, his parents moved to Independence, Missouri, so he could attend the Presbyterian Church Sunday School. He did not attend a conventional school until he was eight. Imagine that, Henry. How old are you, Henry? Seven. So that means that Harry Truman, who was president of the United States, did not actually go to like a formal actual school until he was a year older than you are. What? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? While living in Independence, Missouri, he served as a Shabbos Goy for Jewish neighbors. I hope I said that Shabbos, maybe it's Shabbos, Shabbos or Shabbos Goy for uh, Jewish neighbors doing tasks for them on Shabbat or Sabbath, maybe, that their religion prevented them from doing on that day. Uh, I, I think it's pretty pretty similar to, like, the uh, Sabbath day. So uh, I think. Maybe I'm incorrect. Somebody can correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, of course. Truman was interested in music, reading, and history, all encouraged by his mother, with whom he was very close. As president, he solicited 
political as well as personal advice from her. He rose at five every morning to practice the piano, which he studied more than twice a week until he was 15, becoming quite a skilled player. Truman worked as a page at the 1900 Democratic National Convention in Kansas City. His father had many friends active in the Democratic Party who helped young Harry to gain his first political position. And after graduating from Independence High School in 1901, Harry Truman enrolled in Spalding's Commercial College, a Kansas City business school. He studied bookkeeping, shorthand, and typing, but he left after only one year. Pretty cool stuff, right, Henry, about his early life and birthplace? Yep. Pretty good stuff. Henry's going to uh, split out of this portion of the audio. He might come back a little later to say hi, but I'm going to uh, take it over solo uh, moving forward here. So say bye for now, Henry. Bye. So moving on, here I am on this Father's Day alone now doing the audio. <laughs> One is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. Yeah, so I am solo. Here we go, though. Um, excuse my uh, awful singing. So uh, working career now, kind of getting into uh, you know what Truman did when he was a young man. Harry Truman made use of his business college experience to obtain a job as a timekeeper on the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway sleeping in hobo camps near the rail lines. He then took on a series of clerical jobs and was employed briefly in the mailroom of the Kansas City Star. Truman and his brother Vivian later worked as clerks at the National Bank of Commerce in Kansas City. He returned in 1906 to the Grandview Farm where he lived until entering the Army in 1917. During this period... He courted Bess Wallace. He proposed in 1911, but she turned him down. Truman later said he intended to propose again, but he wanted to have a better income than that earned by a farmer. To that end, during his years on the farm and immediately after World War I, he became active in several business ventures, including a lead and zinc mine near Commerce, Oklahoma a company that bought land and leased the oil drilling rights to prospectors, and speculation in Kansas City real estate. So uh, anybody that's familiar to uh, Commerce, Oklahoma, if that sounds familiar, that's actually the birthplace and childhood home and high school of baseball legend Mickey Mantle. Uh, so pretty interesting. Truman occasionally derived some income from these enterprises, but none proved successful in the long term. Truman is the only president since William McKinley who did not earn a college degree. In addition to having briefly attended business college from 1923 to 1925, he took night courses toward an LLB at the Kansas City Law School, now the University of Missouri Kansas City School of Law but he dropped out after losing re-election as county judge. He was informed by attorneys in the Kansas City area that his education and experience were probably sufficient to receive a license to practice law. He did not pursue it, however, because he won election at as presiding judge. While serving as president in 1947, Truman applied for a license to practice law. A friend who was an attorney began working out the arrangements and he informed Truman that his application had to be notarized. By the time Truman received this information, he had changed his mind, so he never sought notariz notarization. After the rediscovery of Truman's application in 1996, the Missouri Supreme Court issued Truman a post posthumous post homi I always get that wrong. That's that word. Obviously, they awarded him after death an honorary law license. Posthumous? Is it post hom? I, 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 I always get that incorrect. Posthumously. Posthumously. 
posthumously. My lord, I can't believe that I can't pronounce that. Sorry. Okay, here we go. So now his military service, uh, Harry Truman. He was in the National Guard. Because he lacked the funds for college, Harry Truman considering considered attending the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York, which had no tuition, but he was refused an appointment because of poor eyesight. He enlisted in the Missouri National Guard in 1905, and he served until 1911 in the Kansas City-based Battery B, 2nd Missouri Field Artillery Regiment, in which he attained the rank of corporal. At his indu induction, his eyesight without glasses was unacceptable, 2050 in the right eye and 2400 in the left, past the standard for legal blindness. The second time he took the test, he passed by secretly memorizing the eye chart. He was described at 5 feet 10 inches tall, gray-eyed, dark-haired, and of light complexion. Yeah, he, he actually memorized the eye chart. That's how he passed. Can you imagine? It's crazy. Okay, so when the United States entered World War I in 1917, Truman rejoined Battery B, successfully recruiting new soldiers for the expanding unit, for which he was elected as their first lieutenant. Before deployment to France, Truman was sent for training to Camp Donovan, Fort Sill, near Lawton, Oklahoma. Where, when his regiment was federalized as the 129th Field Artillery. The regimental commander during its training was Robert M. Danford, who later served as the Army's Chief of Field Artillery. Truman later said he learned more practical, useful information from Danford in his six weeks than from six months of formal Army instruction. And when Truman later served as an artillery instructor, he consciously patterned his approach on Danford's. Truman also ran the camp canteen with Edward Jacobson, a clothing store clerk he knew from Kansas City. Unlike most canteens funded by unit members, which usually lost money, the canteen operated by Truman and Jacobson turned a profit, returning each soldier's initial $2 investment and $10,000 in dividends in six months. At Fort Sill, Truman met Lieutenant James M. Pendergrast, nephew of Tom Pendergrast, a Kansas City political boss, a connection that had a profound influence on Truman's later life. In mid-1918, about one million soldiers of the American Expen Expeditionary Forces were in France. Exped Expeditionary? Expeditionary Forces were in France. Truman was promoted to captain effective April 23rd. And in July, he became commander of the newly arrived Battery D, 129th Field Artillery, 35th Division. Battery D was known for its discipline problems, and Truman was initially unpopular because of his efforts to restore order. Despite attempts by the men to intimidate him into quitting, Truman succeeded by making his corporals and sergeants accountable for discipline. He promised to back them up if they performed capably and reduce them to private if they did not. In an event memorialized in battery lore as the Battle of Hurun, his soldiers began to flee during a sudden night attack by the Germans in the Vosges Mountains. Truman succeeded at ordering his men to stay and fight, using profanity from his railroad days. The men were so surprised to hear Truman use such language that they immediately obeyed. Truman's unit joined in a massive prearranged assault barrage on September 26th of 1918 at the opening of the Meuse Argonne Offensive. Probably butchered that, but they advanced with difficulty over a pitted terrain to follow the infantry and set up an observation point post west of Sheppey or Cheppy. On September 27th, Truman saw through his binoculars an enemy artillery battery setting up across a river in a position allowing them to fire upon the neighboring 28th Division. Truman's orders limited him to targets facing the 35th Division, 
but he ignored this and patiently waited until the Germans had walked their horses well away from their guns, ensuring they could not relocate out of range of Truman's battery. He then ordered his men to open fire and their attack destroyed the enemy battery. His actions were credited with saving the lives of the 28th Division soldiers who otherwise would have come under fire from the Germans. Truman was giving a dressing down by his regimental commander, Colonel Carl D. Clem, who threatened to convene a court-martial, but Clem never followed through and Truman was not punished. <clears throat> In other action during the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, Truman's battery provided support for George S. Patton's tank brigade and fired some of the last shots of the war on November 11th of 1918. Battery D did not lose any men while under Truman's command in France. To show their appreciation of his leadership, his men presented him with a large, loving cup upon their return to the United States after the war. The war was a transformative experience in which Truman manifested his leadership qualities. He had entered the service in 1917 as a family farmer who had worked in clerical jobs that did not require the ability to motivate and direct others. But during the war, he gained leadership experience and a record of success that greatly enhanced and supported his post-war political career in Missouri. Truman was brought up in the Presbyterian and Baptist churches, but avoided revivals and sometimes ridiculed revivalist preachers. He rarely spoke about religion, which to him primarily meant ethical behavior along traditional Protestant lines. Most of the soldiers he commanded in the war were Catholics, and one of his close friends was the 129th Field Artillery's chaplain, Monsignor L. Curtis Tiernan. The two remained friends until Tiernan's death in 1960, developing leadership and interpersonal skills that later made him a successful politician, helped Truman get along with his Catholic soldiers as he did with soldiers of other Christian denominations and the unit's Jewish members. Truman was honorably discharged from the Army as a captain on May 6th of 1919, and in 1920, he was appointed a major in the officer's reserve corps. He became a lieutenant colonel in 1925 and a colonel in 1932. In the 1920s and 1930s, he commanded 1st Battalion, 379th Field Artillery, 102nd Infantry Division. After promotion to colonel, Truman advanced to command of the same regiment. After his election to the U.S. Senate, Truman was transferred to the General Assignments Group, a holding unit for less active officers, although he had not been consulted in advance. Truman protested his reassignment, which led to his resumption of regimental command. <clears throat> he remained an active reservist until the early 1940s. Truman volunteered for active military service during World War II, but was not accepted, partly because of age and partly because... President Franklin Delano Roosevelt desired senators and congressmen who belonged to the military reserves to support the war effort by remaining in Congress or by ending their active duty service and resuming their congressional seats. He was an inactive reservist from the early 1940s until retiring as a colonel in the then redesignated U.S. Army Reserve on January 20th of 1953. Truman was awarded a World War I victory medal with two battle clasps and a, defense, and a defensive sector clasp. He was also the recipient of two Armed Forces Reserve medals. So there you go. A little bit about the uh, political uh, career. Uh, not the political, I'm sorry, the military career of Harry Truman. Just going to read you a little, some other fun facts about this stuff. Uh, Truman was a war hero who saw action in battle. Truman wanted to go to West Point, but poor eyesight kept him from the academy. He enlisted in the National Guard and was an artillery commander during World War I. Uh, we you know, do know that. We kind of just heard about that. Uh, what else here? Is there anything else uh, that I can tell you guys? Uh, no, 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 no. Just bear with me here. 
As I said, he grew up on a farm in uh, Missouri. Truman's family settled on a farm in Independence, Missouri. His father was very active in the Democratic Party. And when Truman graduated from high school, he worked on his family's farm for 10 years before going to law school in Kansas City. As I just said, he fought World War I. Truman had been part of the Missouri National Guard. He was called up to fight World War I. He served for two years and was commissioned as a commander of the field artillery. By the war's end, he was made a colonel. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of it as far as that particular uh, stuff goes. So now let's move on to political uh, career. After his wartime service, Truman returned to Independence where he married Bess Wallace on June 28th of 1919. The couple had one child, Mary Margaret Truman. Shortly before the wedding, Truman and Jacobson opened a haberdashery together at 104 West 12th Street in downtown Kansas City. After brief initial success, the store went bankrupt during the recession of 1921. Truman did not pay off the last of the debts from that venture until 1935 when he did so with the aid of banker William T. Kemper, who worked behind the scenes to enable Truman's brother Vivian to buy Truman's $5,600 promissory note during the asset sale of a bank that had failed in the Great Depression. The note had risen and fallen in value as it was bought and sold. Interest accumulated and Truman made payments. So by the time the last bank to hold it failed, it was worth nearly $9,000. And thanks to Kemper's efforts, Vivian Truman was able to buy it for $1,000. Jacobson and Truman remained close friends even after their store failed, and Jacobson's advice to Truman on Zionism later played a role in the U.S. government's decision to recognize Israel. With the help of, Can of the Kansas City Democratic machine led by Tom Pentegrast, Truman was elected in 1922 as county court judge of Jackson County's Eastern District. Jackson County's three-judge court included judges from the Western District, Kansas City, the Eastern District, the county outside Kansas City, and a presiding judge elected countywide. <clears throat> this was an administrative rather than a judicial court, similar to county commissioners in many other jurisdictions. Truman lost his 1924 re-election campaign in a Republican wave led by President Calvin Coolidge's landslide election to, f to a full term. Two years selling automobile club memberships convinced Truman that a public service career was safer for a family man approaching middle age, and he planned a run for presiding judge in 1926. Truman won the job in 1926 with the support of the Pendergrass machine, and he was re-elected in 1930. As presiding judge, Truman helped coordinate the 10-year plan, which transformed Jackson County and the Kansas City skyline with new public works projects, including an extensive series of roads and construction of a new white and white designed county court building. Also in 1926, he became president of the National Old Trails Road Association. He oversaw the dedication in the late 1920s of a series of Madonna of the Trail monuments honoring 12 pioneer women. In 1933, Harry Truman was named Missouri's director for the Federal Reemployment Program at the request of Postmaster General James Farley. This was pay payback to Pendergrast for delivering the Kansas City vote to Franklin D. Roosevelt in the 1932 presidential election. The appointment confirmed Pendergrast's control over federal patronage jobs in Missouri and marked the zenith of his power. It also created a relationship between Truman and Roosevelt's aide, Harry Hopkins, and assured Truman's avid support for the New Deal. So pretty cool stuff. Um, some other things that I can kind of tell you, he wasn't a success in private business. As I just said, Truman works at several jobs, including running a sewing supply shop, farming, and a cl and clerking at a bank until he became a county judge in Missouri. Um, so, you know, yeah, it wasn't a very good businessman. He owned a men's clothing shop that almost went bankrupt. Upon graduating high school, Truman only briefly attended college 
taking a variety of odd jobs and helping with the family farming business before eventually joining the National Guard, which he left in 1911. In 1917, he re-entered the fray during World War I and fought in France. Returning home, he and a friend, Eddie Jacobson, decided to open a haberdashery in Kansas City. Thanks to a rough post-war economy, the shop was only open three years before the partners had to close it in 1922. It took 15 years for Truman to pay back the money he owed to creditors. He refused to declare bankruptcy to wipe out the debt. Fortunately, Truman was looking ahead to a career in politics. A wartime friend's uncle, Democrat Thomas Pendergrast, the man in charge of the city's politics, suggested he run for an administrative judge position in Jackson County, Missouri. He lost re-election, but two years later he was elected presiding judge where he served two terms before, me, before moving on to become senator. So uh, there you go. Um, as I said, failed clothes store. Uh, we know that. Um, Truman was elected in 1922 to be one of three judges. Uh, he didn't have a law degree. He didn't fit it. He didn't graduate law school. Um, so pretty interesting. The court exercised corporate powers of the county, um, that sort of thing. So, uh, kind of went over all that already. Now, what about him being Senator from Missouri? All right. After serving as a county judge, Truman wanted to run for governor or Congress. But Pendergrass rejected these ideas. Truman then thought he might serve out his career in some well-paying county sinecure. Circumstances changed when Pendergrass reluctantly backed him as the machine's choice in the 1934 Democratic primary for the U.S. Senate from Missouri. After Pendergrass's first, cho first four choices, I'm sorry, had declined to run. In the primary, Truman defeated Congressman John J. Cochran and Jacob L. Milligan with the solid support of Jackson County, which was crucial to his candidacy. Also critical were the contacts he had made statewide in his capacity as a county official, member of the Freemasons, military, member of the Freemasons a military reservist, and member of the American Legion. In the general election, Truman defeated incumbent Republican Roscoe C. Patterson by nearly 20 percentage points in a continuing wave of pro-New Deal Democrats elected following the Great Dep Depression. Truman assumed office with a reputation as the Senator from Pendergrast. He referred patronage decisions to Pendergrast but maintained that he voted with his own conscience. He later defended the patronage decisions by saying that by offering a little to the machine, he saved a lot. In his first term, Truman spoke out against corporate greed and the dangers of Wall Street speculators and other moneyed special interests attaining too much influence in national affairs. Though he served on the high-profile Appropriations and Interstate Commerce Committees, he was largely ignored by President Roosevelt and had trouble getting calls returned from the White House. During the U.S. Senate election in 1940, United States Attorney Maurice Milligan, former opponent Jacob Milligan's brother, and former Governor Lloyd Stark both challenged Truman in the Democratic primary. Truman was politically weakened by Pendergrass's imprisonment for income tax evasion the previous year. The senator had remained loyal, having claimed that Republican judges, not the Roosevelt administration, were responsible for the boss's downfall. St. Louis party leader Robert E. Hannigan's support of Truman proved crucial. He later brokered the deal that put Truman on the national ticket, and in the end, Stark and Milligan split the anti-Pendergrass vote in the Senate Democratic primary, and Truman won by a total of 8,000 votes. In the November election, Truman defeated Republican Manvel H. Davis by 51 to 49 percent. And as Senator Truman opposed both, opposed both Nazi Germany and Communist Russia. One week after Hitler invaded the Soviet Union in June of 1941, Harry Truman said, 
If we see that Germany is winning, we ought to help Russia. And if Russia is winning, we ought to help Germany. In that way, let them kill as many as possible. Although, I don't want to see Hitler victorious under any circumstances. So now the Truman Committee. In late 1940, Truman traveled to various military bases. The waste and profiteering he saw led him to use his chairmanship of the Committee on Military Affairs Subcommittee on War Mobilization to start investigations into abuses while the nation prepared for war. A new special committee was set up under Truman to conduct a formal investigation. The Roosevelt administration supported this plan rather than weather a more hostile probe by the House of Representatives. The main mission of the committee was to expose and fight waste and corruption in the gigantic government wartime contracts. Truman's initiative convinced Senate leaders of the necessity for the committee, which reflected his demands for honest and efficient administration and his distrust of big business and Wall Street. Truman managed the committee with extraordinary skill and usually achieved consensus, generating heavy media publicity that gave him a national reputation. Activities of the Truman Committee range from criticizing the dollar-a-year men hired by the government, many of whom proved ineffective to investigating a shoddily built New Jersey housing project for war workers. The committee reportedly saved as much as $15 billion, equivalent to $220 billion today, and its activities put Truman on the cover of Time magazine. According to the Senate's historical minutes in leading the committee, Truman erased his earlier public image as an errand runner for Kansas City politicos, and no senator ever gained greater political benefits from chairing a special investigating committee than did Missouri's Harry S. Truman. As I briefly touched on, he did marry uh, his basically his uh, childhood friend. Uh, Elizabeth Bess Virginia Wallace was a childhood friend of Truman's. She attended a finishing school in Kansas City before returning to Independence, Missouri. They did not marry until after World War I when he was 35 and she was 34. Bess did not enjoy her role as First Lady and spent as little time in Washington as she could get away with. So uh, pretty, pretty interesting. Um, Truman was not a first choice candidate for the Senate. Kansas City political boss Tom Pendergrass was turned down by four other possible candidates in 1934 when he sought a candidate to support for a U.S. Senate election. Truman won office by actively hitting the campaign trail. Truman overcame steep odds to win the 1940 Senate election. When Truman's political ally Pendergrass was convicted for tax evasion in 1939, few people thought Truman stood a chance of getting re-elected in Missouri. Again, Truman hit the campaign trail, spoke about his war record and experience as a common man in the Senate, and pulled off another upset. He's, uh, he was good at that. We'll get into that in part two, pulling off upsets. Truman used a key Senate committee to rise to power. At the age of 57, Truman took over a special committee to monitor wasteful spending at business, labor, and government agencies during World War II. He quickly became a household name as the head of the Truman Committee. Now, speaking a little bit about his vice presidency, Truman was not a top candidate for vice president. In 1944, the current vice president, Henry Wallace, was out of favor with many Democrats. Supreme Court Justice William Douglas was FDR's preferred candidate, and Albin Barkley and James Burns were other strong candidates. Truman was a compromise selection who Roosevelt did not know well. Uh, we're going to get into that here in a second, about his uh, you know, vice presidency and that sort of thing. So here we go, vice presidency. Roosevelt's advisors knew that Roosevelt might not live out a fourth term and that his vice president would very likely become the next president. Henry Wallace had served as Roosevelt's vice president for four years and was popular among Democratic voters. But he was viewed as too far to the left and too friendly to labor for some of Roosevelt's advisors. The president and several of his confidants wanted to replace Wallace with someone more acceptable to Democratic Party leaders. Outgoing Democratic National Committee chairman 
Frank C. Walker, incoming chairman Hannigan, party treasurer Edwin W. Pauley, Bronx party boss Ed Flynn, Chicago Mayor Edward Joseph Kelly, and lobbyist George E. Allen all wanted to keep Wallace off the ticket. Roosevelt told party leaders that he would accept either Truman or Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas. State and city party leaders strongly preferred Truman, and Roosevelt agreed. Truman did not campaign for the vice presidential spot, though he welcomed the attention as evidence that he, be, had, he, that he had become more than the senator for, from Pendergrast. Truman's nomination was dubbed the Second Missouri Compromise and was well received. The Roosevelt Truman ticket achieved a 432 to 99 electoral vote victory in the election, defeating the Republican ticket of Governor Thomas E. Dewey of New York and running mate Governor John Bricker of Ohio. Truman was sworn in as vice president on January 20th of 1945. Truman's brief vice presidency was relatively uneventful. On April 10th of 1945, Truman cast his only tie-breaking vote as president of the Senate against a Robert A. Taft amendment that would have blocked the post-war delivery of Lend-Lease Act items contracted for during the war. Roosevelt rarely contacted him, even to inform him of major decisions. The president and vice president met alone together only twice during their time in office. In one of his first acts as vice president, Harry Truman created some controversy when he attended the disgraced Pendergrass's funeral. He brushed aside the criticism, saying simply, He was always my friend, and I have always been his. He had rarely discussed world affairs or domestic politics with Roosevelt. He was uninformed about major initiatives relating to the war and the top-secret Manhattan Project, which was about to test the world's first atomic bomb. And in a... That was weird. My uh, recording uh, cut off. I apologize there, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So as I said, uh, test of the world's first atomic bomb in an event that generated negative publicity for Truman. He was photographed with actress Lauren Bacall sitting atop the piano at the National Press Club as he played for soldiers. Truman had been vice president for 82 days when President Roosevelt died. Truman, presiding over the Senate as usual, had just adjourned the, adjourned the session for the day and was preparing to have a drink in House Speaker Sam Rayburn's office when he received an urgent message to go immediately to the White House. This is where Eleanor Roosevelt told him that her husband had died after a massive cerebral hemorrhage. Harry Truman was spor sworn in as president at 7.09 p.m. in the West Wing of the White House by Chief Justice Harlan F. Stone. So there you go, leading all the way up to his presidency. As I had just said, he only served as vice president for 82 days. In July of 1944, Truman was nominated to run for vice president with Roosevelt, and Truman took the vice presidential oath on January 20th of 1945. And after Roosevelt's unexpected death 82 days later, on April 12th of 1945, Truman was sworn in as the 33rd president. Um, so yeah, um, pretty, pretty crazy. Uh, only 82 days. That's pretty crazy. Um, not a long time at all. Uh, he succeeded, uh, you know, FDR after FDR died. We know that. Um, just trying to see if there's anything else I'm leaving out here. I just don't like to leave anything out. Truman's reputation for fairness grew out of his stint in the U S Senate he increased, he increased regulation of American shippers and studied defense spending for any signs of waste. His work caught the eye of Franklin Roosevelt's campaign committee, which was prepping Roosevelt's fourth term as president and fearing the ailing Roosevelt wouldn't survive through his term. Choosing a vice president was perhaps more crucial than ever. Then we know that he, Truman became the uh, vice president. Um, yeah, he wasn't a top candidate for vice president. We know that. All right, so now just another little uh, brief reading synopsis, kind of going over the same type stuff. But Truman was born on May 8th of 1845 in the farm community of Lamar, uh, Missouri, to John Truman, a livestock trader, and Martha Young Truman. Um, Truman's parents gave him the middle initial S to honor his grandfathers. We talked about that. 
And in 1890, the Truman settled in Independence, Missouri, where Harry attended school and was a strong student. And as a child, he had to wear thick eyeglasses due to poor vision, and his doctor advised him not to play sports in order to avoid breaking them. Truman had hoped to attend the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, but his eyesight prevented him from gaining admittance. Uh, Truman's family could not afford to send him to college, so after graduating high school in 1901, uh, he worked as a bank clerk and held various other jobs. Um, starting in 1906, he spent over a decade helping his father manage the family's 600-acre farm near Grandview, Missouri. Um, we know that. Then he was in the National Guard. Then World War I. Uh, we know after the war, he came back and he uh, married uh, Bess. And then he was a county judge. So we know all this is pretty um, pretty basic stuff that we just went over here. Um so yeah, uh, pr pretty basic stuff. I uh, just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing anything. Uh, let's say in 1934, Truman was elected to the U.S. Senate. As a senator, he supported President FDR's New Deal programs. He designed to help lift the nation out of the Great Depression, which began in 1929 and lasted about a decade. Additionally, Truman was instrumental in the passage of the Civil Aeronautics Act of 1938, which established government regulation of the burgeoning aviation industry, and the Transportation Act of 1940, which established new federal regulations for America's railroad, shipping, and trucking industries. From 1941 to 1944, Truman headed the Senate Special Committee to investigate the National Defense Program, which worked to reduce waste and mismanagement in the U.S. military spending. Commonly known as the Truman Committee, it saved American taxpayers millions of dollars and propelled Truman into the national spotlight. So there you go. That's kind of the uh, young life, childhood, birthplace, growing up, education, and political career of Harry S. Truman. One last thing I do want to read, of course, as I said, the S does not stand for anything. As, he, as uh, Henry said, um, Truman was born in Lamar, Missouri. Um, the middle name for their first child, so they settled on S. They didn't. They, uh, his parents couldn't realize they couldn't decide on a middle name. They settled on S. It was obviously, you know, a, a kind of an homage to his grandfather's. Um, and since his S in his name uh, of sorts, rather than, is is a name of sorts rather than an initial, it can stand alone without a period. Though stylistically, it's most often seen with a period, but it doesn't stand for anything. The S is not like, you know, it's not like Sam or, you know, whatever. It's nothing like that. There's no middle name. It's just as in, uh, in honor of his grandfathers. Um, so, yeah, it, it doesn't stand for anything. It's a very fun little trivia fact that you can give to people. Say, hey, the S in Harry S. Truman, what does it stand for? And people will probably rattle off a bunch of names to you. And none of them are true. So... <laughs> Uh, pretty cool, fun stuff. So there you go, Harry S. Truman. Now listen, all the pictures that you're seeing, of course, you know, you see all the pictures of Truman and all that stuff I always show, but um, the pictures of like his birthplace or childhood home or any of those pictures, those are not my photos. Those are stock photos I found, you know, online on Google and such. Um, I did not visit his birthplace or any of those homes in Missouri uh, and you're going to find out in part two. I did visit the, his presidential library where his gravesite is, but it was closed due to COVID and renovations last year in 2020. So uh, I wasn't able to actually stand right at his gravesite. He's one of only two that that happened with. So actually three. Um, so or maybe even it's four. Wow, look at this. Now I'm rattling off a bunch. But anyway, we'll get into that tomorrow for part two. So I hope you enjoyed this part one. Taking a look at Harry Truman. And his youth, childhood, and young education and political career. We will be back tomorrow for part two with Truman's presidency, the atomic bomb dropping, the Korean War, and all of it. His legacy, his death, and of course his gravesite uh, there in Missouri. We'll get into that in part two. Thanks again, guys, for all the support. Keep all the comments and questions coming. Henry and I love it. Henry gets very excited when I tell him, hey, uh, you know, Laser World wrote to us or, you know, Logan wrote to us or, you know, uh, Rebecca wrote to us or Les wrote to us. He loves it. He thinks it's so exciting when our subscribers write comments and questions to us. So keep them all coming. We can't thank you enough for the support. 
And again, a very happy Father's Day. I know it's belated at this point, but happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. And we will see you tomorrow for part two. Bye, guys.